The Way Beyond by Joseph S. Benner In our booklet, The Way Out was pointed the way to freedom from lack, limitation, inharmony, disease and unhappiness, and there is no excuse for any who faithfully follow the suggestions given to be any longer in such condition. The booklet has reached scores of thousands of readers, and many have been lifted by its truths into a new consciousness, and thereby into a new world, where everything and everybody are changed, for they are seeing with new eyes and with a different understanding. That which appears is no longer what it seemed, but the good and the real are now visible and can be seen shining through all conditions and people, because they are now looked for. And the former negative tendencies are tabooed and not allowed to enter the consciousness. This is not the case with all, of course, for a great number have not been able to conquer those tendencies which so long have been permitted to rule. The press of circumstances and the negative conditions everywhere manifest seemingly have been too much for them and they have become utterly discouraged, not knowing that they actually have within themselves the power to rise out of these conditions and that help is waiting the moment they awaken from their despondency and definitely determined to do the best they can to prove the truth of what was stated in the booklet. It is for such that this message is written, with the earnest desire that all who read will be so inspired by its truths that they will make the necessary effort and will thus receive the good that has been waiting for them from the beginning. We first urge that everyone who reads procure a copy of The Way Out, if one is not already owned, and that it be studied carefully and prayerfully. It will do no good merely to read it, or even to study it, unless what is given you to do is faithfully tried until proven. That is, tried day after day in all your thinking, speaking and acting, for at least one month. If you will do it that long, we promise that such a change will manifest in your consciousness, and likewise in your affairs, that it will be a turning point in your life, and you will never again return to the old way of thinking and acting. Is it not then worth the effort? Then do not let anything prevent you from making a supreme effort, asking God to give you the strength and ability to accomplish what we have shown. Now we are going to try to make clear to you the statement in The Way Out that God is within you. Make it so clear that never more will you think of Him as somewhere up in the skies, nor will you be uncertain as to who or what He is. First try to realize that the life animating and growing you is not your life, that you have no control over it, that it does things to you, causes you to do things, puts you through all the experiences you are undergoing without your consent, and that seemingly it knows just what it is doing and must have a very wise and loving purpose in doing it. Likewise, the consciousness that you call yours seemingly receives all its ideas, thoughts and impressions wholly independently of your will or desire. They come into your mind when they will, influence your feelings and actions continually, 
and you have little power to prevent it. Also, you will admit that you have no power of your own, that you can think, speak and do only as the power to do these things is given you from within. And that something doing all this unquestionably is a greater, far wiser and a very loving something that knows always what to do, knows the end before the beginning, and is apparently trying to teach your human mind about itself, teach it the lessons contained in each experience, and the laws back of life and of physical manifestation. Because that something is so different from, and yet is so intimate a part of what you call you, it must be akin to what is termed God. We have called it the higher self, and it is in fact the very God in you. It is like a ray or reflection of God's mind shining somewhere deep within your consciousness, a light which shineth in the darkness, but the darkness of the outer human mind knoweth it not. For certainly when it can get your mind's attention and you listen, it displays a wisdom that is as near to that God as the human mind can conceive. And those who heed and obey are given a glimpse of something wonderful which, while inexpressible, is altogether divine and most satisfying. You have heard the statement that God is all in all, and of the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Then that light must be a ray of God's mind that shines in the darkness of the human mind, ever trying to make it aware of its divine source within itself, the mind of God, from which it derives all that it is, all that it has and all power to be, to know or to do anything. Then think, if God is all in all, he is in everything and in everybody, no matter what it is or who he is, it must be so. Yet who of us always sees and acknowledges him in such? And because we do not acknowledge him in his manifestations, refuse to see him and call him everything he is not, we see instead all the error, the evil, and the lies that our darkened minds have accepted as real, lose ourselves in the maze of our separate misconceptions, and in consequence endure the inharmonies, disease and suffering of minds, thinking themselves apart from the consciousness that included them and all that is. God being all in all, then all things and all men are good and perfect. They could not be otherwise when God and his goodness and perfection are everywhere. But make no mistake, when stating that all things and all men are good and perfect, we are not speaking of what you with your separate mind and present understanding see and believes. We are not speaking of appearances, of your separate mind's creations. For what you see now are only the pictures you have built in your mind of what you thought was the truth, before you really knew about God's being all in all and ever showing forth his goodness beauty and perfection in everything to those who have eyes to see. Therefore it is necessary first to convince your mind of the truth, 
so that it can be free itself of all these untrue beliefs, these false pictures of God and of his expressions of himself that it has built and is carrying around in its consciousness. Then listen. God, who is all in all, and who is all good and all perfect, must be also all wise, all loving and all powerful. Anything less than these is not of God, but must be man's wrong, ignorant and distorted concepts of God and of his expressions of himself. Think that out until you see how true it is. Then all things of an inharmonious or unhappy nature that you see, whatever they be that are less than good or perfect, are only what you think is so, because of ignorance or wrong teaching. And so long as you continue to believe these things are real, they will continue to be real to you, no matter what they are, whether they pertain to the conditions surrounding you, to your body, to yourself, to your affairs, or to those invisible things which relate to and affect your life, health and happiness. Now let us relate this truth of God being all in all to yourself. If he is all we have stated, then he must be the real you, must be that higher, greater you we pointed out earlier in this message, whose life is animating your body, whose mind is influencing all your thoughts, speech and actions, and whose power enables you to do all things that you do. It must then be his consciousness that is your consciousness, but stepped down through your higher self to your soul and then to your human mind, expressing itself on the spiritual plane in your higher self as the Christ consciousness, on the soul plane in your soul or soul consciousness and on the physical plane in your brain mind as mortal consciousness. But it is all God's consciousness relayed down through your higher self and enabling you to be as much aware of God, the real self of you and the one self of all men. For is he not all in all? as the channel of your darkened mortal mind has been illumined to perceive him and to partake of his consciousness. It is said that to know God, man must first know his self, and when you truly know that you are not a thing of flesh and blood, but are a human soul, or a centre of consciousness clothed by a garment of flesh, even as your soul clothes your real or Christ self, the Holy Spirit or consciousness of God. As we have shown above, you can begin to understand how God actually is within you, is you. Now let us consider you first as a soul, a centre of consciousness and then we will try to show you the relation of your soul to your human mind and your higher spiritual self. You, in your integrity, are a soul and are pure consciousness. In other words, you are that which is conscious or aware of all that comes to you from without through the avenue of your five senses or through vibrations which they are not sensitive enough to perceive, such as impressions or thoughts from other centres of consciousness. All of these sensations are brought to your consciousness through the mediumship of your human mind, while the vibrations mentioned 
are received directly by the soul and are interpreted to the mind according to how the mind has been prepared to understand them. As a soul, or consciousness, you are distinct from your human mind, for the mind serves merely as an instrument to receive and inform you of what comes from without in the world of matter. Yet your mind is in reality an outer extension of your soul consciousness, slowed down to the mental capacity of your human brain there serving as your agent in the informing you of all things going on in the physical world and the carrying out of your instructions pertaining to that world. In that partial and necessarily limited consciousness, your mind grew to think itself a self and separate from you in your soul consciousness. In this fancied separateness, it gradually filled its consciousness with all those wrong concepts and beliefs about physical and mental things spoken of above, which grew so real and tangible in its consciousness that they in time ruled all your thoughts, speech and actions. And this outer and fancied separate consciousness is what constitutes your lower or mortal self. But these concepts and beliefs should have no influence over your soul consciousness, only as you let them. The proof is, when you get quiet and still your mind and shut out all thoughts and impressions coming from without, then you are in your pure soul consciousness and are free to be aware of the impressions coming from within your soul. For then you learn that deep within the soul there is a higher consciousness and a spiritual intelligence that presses the soul from within, informing you of spiritual things. Even as the outer mind's consciousness presses from without, to inform you of material things. And that higher or innermost consciousness is that of your higher or divine self. In reality, there is only one self, but this enables you to see how the higher self, the spirit of God in man, reaches down or out from the centre of man's being in divine consciousness, into the soul consciousness, and thence outward into the mortal mind, giving to man's brain its consciousness, which causes man to think his consciousness separate, when it is only the consciousness of God thinned down to the brain mind's capacity to hold and use it. Then the higher self, this Spirit of God deep within you is the real you, is the self that has ever been directing all the activities of your life, has been actually doing all through you, knows just what he is doing, assumes all responsibility and evidently sees the end before the beginning. Then you can realise that of your human self, you do nothing, and never did anything, that all the power, knowledge and life you have comes from your higher self, and that if you ever wish to be, to do, or to have anything, and to gain the freedom, happiness and peace your soul seeks, it behooves you to get well acquainted with that self to learn to cooperate with him, and to wait upon and serve him in all the activities of your life. From this you can also realise that the reason you failed to gain any of these things in the past is because you tried to get them without reckoning upon your higher self or knowing his part in the doing, 
you tried to do it alone. So he let you fail again and again until you came to that place where you learned the uselessness of trying to do anything yourself and you became willing to turn to him and humbly ask him to take charge and you gladly yielded over all to him and put all your trust in him. Everyone must come to that place, every seeker of the true way of life. For until self with its human mind has been completely humbled and gives up utterly, it cannot accept the truth of its non-reality and of the actuality of the God-man within, and that he can do all and will provide all things when the human mind yields itself wholly to him. If you who read have come to that place and are truly ready to give yourself to the God-self within, then we will tell you of a great but simple law that you must follow. That law is, whatever is before you to do, do it the best you know how in order to please your God-self. For he placed you just where you now are and provided the particular task confronting you as the best means and opportunity in which to teach your human mind the next lessons you are to learn and to develop in you the spiritual qualities you still lack in order to make your human self a perfect instrument for his use. Then in doing that task, for he provides all tasks and brings you to all problems, having now given yourself over wholly to him, you are concerned only that you do what is before you the best you can, knowing that he will provide the power, understanding and ability needed and that you are not responsible any more for results, as they are all in his keeping. For have you not put the full responsibility on him, are now trusting everything to him, and consequently you no longer have any fears, doubts or worries to clog your mind and to prevent his accomplishing his purpose for you? Only by thus yielding all to him can you be a clean and open channel through which he can bring through into being the good and perfect things he intends to manifest in your life. For he can intend nothing less than that, else why all the trouble he is taking with you. It is all a matter of trusting, dear friend, of trusting the God within you. If you have failed in the past, no matter how hard you tried, it is because you did not trust enough. Therefore we are bringing this great truth closer by asking you truly to trust the God within, your higher self, the Christ in you who we have shown has all the wisdom and power of God, to let go utterly and put all your trust in him. You must learn thus to trust until it becomes the supreme and dominant influence in your consciousness, for the only thing that prevents your good from coming into natural and continuous expression is your lack of real faith and trust in the God within you, your Christ Self. This means that if instead of faith and trust you still let fears, doubts and worries into your mind, then of course there they cause you to build negative pictures of the things you are fearing 
and you proceed to entertain and feed them by further fears until they become actual living things in your mental world. In time they largely control your mind and you are helpless. And naturally every time you succumb to them you grow more helpless. Is this not true? Then what is the solution? Only one thing. You must let go completely and turn the whole problem over to God. Do that actually. Wash your hands of it. Step out from under and throw the entire responsibility upon him. Think. Can you do that? Try it. In fact, he wants you to do it. Talk to this God within the real self of you and tell him that you are through, that you have done your best and that is all you can do and it was useless. And now it is up to him. He will have to handle it. Actually mean it and then let go and truly wash your hands of all responsibility. Then, and not until then, has he got your mind in the state where it is ready to hear his voice and learn what he has in store for you. For once it has really thrown off the burden of self, there is no longer a negative force attracting the old fears, doubts and worries. Instead you become a positive force in your believing that he now will take care of all things for you intend to do nothing and to give him the chance to prove what he can do. It is to just that state of mind he desires to bring you, where you actually let go, giving the load you are carrying over to him and thereby become as free as a little child, just such a child as we will now picture to you. Standing on the sidewalk of a busy street waiting for the light signal is a little boy of three years whose hand is tightly clasped in that of his father. Then they start across. Is the child frightened by the big automobiles and the noise and tumult at this busy corner? No, he sees and knows no danger and gleefully enjoys the turmoil and the mixing with the crowd hurrying across. For he knows that dad is taking care of him and will not let any harm come to him. Just as he unconsciously knows that dad will feed and clothe him. For to him dad is as God who will provide everything he needs and take every care of him. Think you your God self does not love you and is not taking equal care of you, his child? For are you not a part of his being and does he not need you to express his self? Then how could he let you really suffer or come to any harm? What your human mind suffers and the dangers it fears are only the nightmares of childhood which disappear when the light of understanding is brought. Besides, such mental suffering actually burns away the qualities of self that hinder his perfect expression. While through the fears that come and persist, he teaches you how to become strong. It is these mental fears for they are purely mental, that is, they exist in your mind, not in his consciousness, that are clogging your mind channel and preventing his pouring through it the good that awaits.
then you will have to cleanse your mind of all such negative things, of every doubt, fear or worry, and especially of those wrong pictures you are carrying around in your consciousness. Do you still see yourself as sick or ailing or poor or very much needing anything? Then can you not realize it is that picture which is clogging up the channel? For what you think and carry around in consciousness as being so always out manifests itself. How can the good you wish to manifest get by this picture? That is the whole trouble, dear friend. You have not cleansed your mind of those old picture beliefs, some of which are hiding down in the dark corners of your subconsciousness, purposely refusing to come out into the light. For they know, the moment you see them for what they are, their days are numbered. In fact, you must go down into the subconsciousness and dig out all of such and cast them forth. For until the whole mind is clean and free of all negative and untrue thoughts and feelings and is kept so, it cannot be brought into your God consciousness where there are only positive, true, good and perfect ideas about you and you can see all things in their reality, even as he sees, and you can know as he knows. Your mind, thus becoming a perfect channel through which he can give you your divine heritage, which he has so long had waiting for you. Now we ask you to try to imagine yourself in the consciousness of your God Self and to see with his eyes this self you call you and the other selves around you and the world you live in. In the first place, know that as he is all wise, all loving and all powerful and is still you, but a perfect you, he must have a perfect mind and body, but not like your physical self. His body is that image and likeness of God, in which man was originally formed. And if God made man like himself, who could change man, a perfect being? Not even man himself then man must still be perfect. Yes, it cannot be otherwise. For think you anyone could alter or bring to naught any perfect thing God created? We know you are asking, how then did man become so changed? He is not changed, the real man. He is your higher self, the real you, the perfect man, just as God created him, as he now sees him, and as he will always be. Now listen, what you and others see are mortal man's creations, not God's. They are merely the creations of man's fancied separate mind, and have no existence except in his brain mind's consciousness. When God gave man free will, he gave him the power to think as he wills, which means to create. He could think good, God's thoughts, or evil, not God's thoughts. Man did not realize his God nature then. He had only his human nature to judge by, and the only way to learn was not by taking God's or anyone's word for things, but by thinking, by trying and finding what his creations, the things, conditions and people of his world, were not.
And so he thought, and created, and tried from the beginning to make perfect things and conditions in this world of his consciousness, with the results you see everywhere about you. Not that many men back through the ages have not learned the truth, the truth we are trying to teach you, that they can do nothing of themselves, but with the help of God within them, they can do all things, can have all things, can be all things. And with his help, such have come into and are now dwelling in their Christ consciousness, are one with him, and are doing the Father's work on earth, even as others are doing it in heaven. And what do they see in this consciousness? They see that they are souls living in a perfect world where every soul is young, good, beautiful and perfect, even as the Father conceived them, and where everything is devised for the free use and enjoyment of its inhabitants which means that there is a rich abundance of all good things for everyone always available. No one there ever needs anything, for it is always at hand. There, any desired thing is created by thought, and you can have it when and as you wish it. Then, of course, no one takes from another or owes another anything for everyone has everything he wants, because all he has to do is to see clearly in his mind what he wants, and it takes shape and substance right before his eyes, ready and perfect for his use. From this you can see there is no selfishness there, for all there are are those in whom self no longer is. There is no injustice, for the law of justice rules everyone's consciousness. There is no evil, for it has been learned that evil, sin, sickness, inharmony and unhappiness are the creations of mortal mind. And of course, one who is selfless is in his Christ consciousness and no longer thinks and thereby creates such things. Does this help you to see how and why man is responsible for this outer world? That it is his own creation and not God's creation? And can you now see what is God's world, his kingdom, your heavenly home, where you can return as a prodigal son any time you will be remembering and seeing only the truth? and where you will find your heavenly Father waiting for you with outstretched arms? And who is this heavenly Father? He is your own real self, the God you, that is always back in that consciousness deep within your soul, where you can retire any moment you will. All you have to do is to throw off everything that presses upon your consciousness from the outer world of the human mind and turn your attention to the inner world of spirit. Especially must you refuse to see, to talk about, or let your mind dwell upon outer conditions. No matter how hard they appear or how they seemingly affect you, for remember, they exist only in the world of man's mind, and not in the real world the God you sees and lives in. If you resolutely do this, it will not be long before you will have evidence of the reality of this kingdom within, and you will hear his voice and receive definite guidance as to what he wills and what is his purpose for you? For he must have a purpose, or why all this disciplining and developing of your mind and character? Make no mistake, 
he knows what he is doing and why. And when you have given self entirely over to him, he will take you into his consciousness and there you will work with him to accomplish what he intended from the beginning. The beautiful part of it is that there are others there working with you, others who have found him within themselves, have found there a new and wonderful self, a wonderful world, and wonderful comrades in it, a world far more real than the ever-changing one of their own creation. Yes, they have found their eternal home, the kingdom of God's consciousness, the same home which Jesus described in his many parables when trying to tell of it to the people of his day, where he went after his mission was accomplished, where he now lives and works among his disciples who have followed him there. To them he is a very real and actual teacher, guide and friend who is preparing them for the great day when he will make himself manifest to all his followers on earth and will bring heaven down to earth to be truly in the midst of men. This shows you what is possible to him who learns to think only true thoughts about himself and about all in his world. Some wonderful truths have been unfolded to you, and now it surely will be easier for you to do the things you have found you must do, if you would free yourself from the old consciousness and the conditions surrounding you, and would enter the new consciousness awaiting. The way out has been shown you, but you must walk in it, no one can do that for you. You cannot be shoved, nor can you jump or slide into the kingdom. You have to earn your right to enter, have to walk every step of the way there. No matter how difficult and steep grows the path, it is no journey to be taken by the half-hearted and the weak need. If you are now convinced of the truth of what was shown, the next step then is to try to prove its truth. First, by getting thoroughly acquainted with this real self of you, by seeing him as yourself, and by going about in his consciousness. Practice this daily until you actually feel him within, feel him giving you of his power, of his vitalizing life and energy, and you thrill at the realization of it. Then make the determined and unrelenting effort to think only his thoughts and to see and hear only the good and perfection in everything and everyone, resolutely shutting your eyes and mind to appearances and looking right through them to the good they hide. You can do this if you will. You can find good anywhere if you truly look for it. For with such a desire in your heart you connect up with the good, your God consciousness within, which will illumine your mind and enable you to see with your spiritual eyes and to hear with your spiritual ears what is hidden from mortal consciousness. With every loving desire to please this God you, you will find help given you to do it, especially when you earnestly put your trust in him. When you do thus trust him, you will learn what he means when he says, If you abide in me, and let my words abide in you, you can ask what you will, and it will be done unto you. For when your trust becomes absolute, you will not want anything anymore, for you will know 
that all he is and has is yours, and there will be no more need to ask, as he will be giving you continually of the riches of his kingdom, whose store is inexhaustible. This then, dear friend, is what we would have you do, to strive every moment of the day, no matter what you are doing, to abide in his consciousness, to put all your trust in him, leaving everything to him, knowing that he will do all things through you perfectly, as you keep your mind free from doubts, fears, worries, untrue thoughts, and concern about results. For you thus enable him truly and freely to live his life in you, do his will in you, be his self in you, even as he intended and has been preparing you for all your mortal life. In the following verses from the Sermon on the Mount is found all that anyone needs to know who is facing the tribulations now being visited upon humanity and is seeking the reason and purpose of it all and how to be free from them. We will point out to you how wonderfully it all applies to this very question we have been discussing and how it perfectly confirms all that was stated. We will start with these significant words. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will cling to the one and neglect the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Think carefully what this means. How many of you are not trying to serve two masters? Yes, you are trying to serve God, but who of you at the present time are not fearing money and its power? Who are not bowing down before it, daily acknowledging its power over you, afraid to do anything because of the control it has over most of your thoughts and acts? In fact, is not its influence such that it receives now ten times, nay, one hundred times, more of your thoughts than does God? And yet you say you are not serving mammon. Dear friends, you cannot continue this way. You cannot any longer serve two masters. The time has come when you must decide whom you will serve, God or mammon. For why think you these tribulations are being visited upon mankind? It is because in the past you have been trying to serve both God and mammon, and now both have withdrawn their support and are letting you cast for yourself. So you are finally learning that you, of yourself, can do nothing, and you are now facing the necessity of choosing whom you will serve, and to whom you will give all your allegiance. For when you do choose, that is what will be required of you. And this applies particularly to all seekers after truth, but includes also those who may in any way have claimed God's help. For those who are truly serving him, placing all their trust in him, are unaffected by present conditions and are continually prospered, while those who have given full allegiance to mammon are likewise greatly prospered, seemingly but their time of reckoning has not yet come. We are not interested in the latter, however. Our thoughts are for you, you who are anxious to serve God and to free yourself from the power of mammon forever. To you, Jesus' words are especially directed. Hear them, 
for they are actual promises and contain very definite and unmistakable instructions for you. Therefore I say unto you, be not anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall wear. Is not the life of more value than food, and the body than raiment? Observe the birds of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of greater value than they? Besides, which of you, by being anxious, can prolong his life one moment? And why are you anxious about raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I tell you that Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Here you are told plainly the difference between what is required of those who would serve God and those who serve mammon. The former are clearly shown that they need not be overly concerned about the affairs of their life, about food, drink and clothes. For they are promised that God will take care of all these things, if they trust him. Besides, they know that it is his life that is in them, even as in the birds and the lilies, and surely he will feed and clothe and provide for his own life. But does mammon require such trust? No, he ever holds over his servants the whip of fear and loss, lack and poverty, until they become abject slaves to his slightest wish. The former, in their efforts to please God, develop and portray a life of loving and selfless service, while the latter, as they yield more and more to mammon, develop into cold and heartless beings, thinking only of how to satisfy their utterly selfish lusts. But listen further to Jesus' words. Therefore be not anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these the Gentiles seek, and your heavenly Father knows you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. The Gentiles was a term used by the Jews as synonymous with heathen, or those who were not of the chosen people of God, and undoubtedly Jesus used it with that meaning. In other words, the chosen of God, his servants, know him and trust him fully for all their needs. But the Gentiles, those who are not his people, are the ones who are always anxious about what they shall eat or drink or how they shall be clothed. So Jesus tells us that if we will make first the seeking of the kingdom of God, the divine consciousness where love and peace abide, putting all our trust in God and giving all our service to him, all the things needed in the physical world will be richly provided. The emphatic diaglot translation from the original Greek states they will be super-added. Be not anxious then for the morrow, for the morrow will have its own problems, sufficient for each day 
are the problems thereof. How much more plainly can it be declared to us that we are being lovingly watched over and cared for, that all our needs are known and will be supplied, and that our only thought should be in knowing that everything will be provided for us, even as God provides for the birds and the lilies. Then it all resolves itself in a matter of trusting and abiding, and of doing the thing that is right before us to do the very best we know how, leaving the results tomorrow and all else to God. Can you bring yourself to do this? Dear friends, you must decide now. This is the time when we must choose on which side we will stand. Only a little while remains. Whom then are you going to serve? Do you require more tribulations and harder tests to help you decide? But remember, it can no longer be a half-hearted or a divided service. That will not be any longer permitted. The hopelessness of such should have been proved to you from former efforts. You must give up all, all that you have and are, and follow him. You must make him and the finding of his kingdom and the living of his life first in your consciousness. It must be an every moment of the day trusting. The thought of him must supersede every other thought. That is the kind of trusting he now seeks from you. And ah, oh, the joy and blessedness of those who have given themselves over wholly to him in such trusting.